You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get to this week's guest, a former Marine Intelligence Officer, uh, who has a long career, or at least a very detailed career, in the Marine Corps, but now does incredible work post-military career with an organization called Carry the Load. We'll meet him in just a moment. First, our normal announcements. Uh, please follow us on other social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground at Hazard Ground Podcast. As well, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Smash that like button there. Give a thumbs up to all the content. We certainly appreciate you guys watching all of our episodes there as well. Feel free to leave comments in the comments section as well. Continue to leave us Apple reviews or wherever you get your podcast, give us a five-star rating and tell us why you love the show. We certainly appreciate it. Feel free to reach out to us on our website, hazardground.com. In fact, I got a, uh, a, a note from a listener um, a day or two ago. And even though they weren't too happy, (laughs) I certainly appreciate everybody reaching out good, bad, or indifferent guys. We love the feedback for the show and we're always trying to get, uh, the guests and the stories that you guys want to see in here. So don't ever hesitate about reaching out to us on hazardground.com. You can hit that contact us button right there and reach out to me directly as well on hazardground.com. You can go at the bottom of the homepage and click on that Amazon button. Prime day just passed a little while back. And, uh, uh it's a great way for you guys to help out veterans charities. Cause all you do is go to hazardground.com, click on that Amazon button. It redirects you to Amazon. You can do all of your normal Amazon shopping. Uh, we will get a percentage of what you guys spend. I donate a percentage of that back to some of the charities and organizations you've heard on the show, like the one you'll hear featured here today. And now let's meet our guest. Go. <laughs> Again, hazardground.com. Click on the Amazon button. All right. Uh, this week's guest is a formal former Marine officer uh, who spent a total of five years on active duty, had one deployment to Iraq, believe it or not, in a pre-9-11 world where they conducted a certain amount of, at the time, were classified operations, and and the story is really in-depth, and it's a very high-level, interesting job that not many Marines have found their way to. In his post-military career, outside of doing commercial real estate on the side, he works for an organization as an ambassador called Carry the Load. He's also their, uh, their nonprofit uh, with and they get the title nonprofit. Um, he's on the board of the nonprofit commission. Uh, he'll let he'll explain it here in a minute. I wrote that down in the notes of my abbreviations, <laughs> but it's JJ Leonard joining us here on the Hazard Ground podcast. JJ, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate you having me. All right, carry the ambassador. And what was the title again? Uh, just we have, we have a nonprofit partner committee that partner. works yeah, with all of our nonprofit partners, which hey. I can explain in detail. He's, we'll he's on the board of the nonprofit partner committee is what it is all right um it's great to meet you uh and it's funny how uh it's interesting how i, how I came across you because um uh, a couple of weeks back uh i got the privilege of interviewing uh pamela zembeck who is the spouse of the late major doug zembeck the line of fallujah and um i, I was very excited to tell his story uh, and hear about it and i'm very uh, glad that I've I've got a chance to get some more of those people on the show. They'll be coming up here in coming weeks. But um, that's how I sort of came across your name as your connection to Doug. You and Doug went to the academy together at the same time. But uh, we're here to tell your story. So it's just interesting. You actually have a connection to some other famous uh, Marines and, and Navy Navy SEALs as well. And I, I just it's you know the the connection within the military, as big as it is, is sometimes crazy how small it is. Absolutely, no, it, it really is. I mean, it's. Hundreds of thousands of, of of veterans out there, but you know, you know, you the academy obviously brought us together and went our separate directions, but uh, kept in touch. And and you're right, 100. percent It just uh, is a small world when you really boil it down. All right, so you went to the Naval Academy, um, and uh, you played football there as well. And um, you were probably there during the 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 very good years for the Navy when it came to the army Navy game, right? Like, did you guys win? How many, how many what was your record in the army Navy game? Uh, when I was there, we were one in three. Okay. So you were three. You were three. <laughs> the, the really, the really good years for, for Navy started. Uh, like later. Thousand when, plus. Yeah. Once we started running the option, unfortunately um, we were not as good when I was there. We were, we ran the pro style offense and, um, should have been running the option. Air force was the one that, that adopted that early, earliest. And, and one as a result, right? Um, so it took it took the Army and, and Navy a little a little longer to uh, to follow suit. 
Oh, I wish I could say I feel bad for you, but I don't. Go on. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you started out at the Naval Academy. Did you always know you wanted to go to the Naval Academy? You know, I, I didn't. Um, I had like, both my grandfathers uh, served in um, World War II. Uh, my, one of my grandfathers served in the Army for uh, 34 years. Um, was a basically, he lied about his age when he was 16 to get in. Um, served in World War II um, under Patton and, and a lot of the campaigns in, in Europe and Northern Africa. And then he um, was in Korea and ended up being a chief one officer five. And so, um, you know, just salty, greatest generation um, army veteran who I looked up to um, greatly. And then and then my grandfather was uh, essentially was active duty Navy for a while and then spent 20 years in the reserves in the Navy um, reserve. So had that in my family, um, very patriotic family, a lot of respect for the military. Didn't really think that was a route I was going to go. Honestly, my grades were decent um, in high school, but um, you know, I had good, good test scores, but fortunately I was recruited to play football. I was recruited by some non-military academy schools and, and um, I think I'm, I look back and as immature as I was, I'm grateful that I was mature enough to make a decision knowing that, you know, as an offensive lineman, I wasn't going to play football on Sundays. And uh, I was really intrigued by the opportunity to go to a service academy and, and Navy was the one that, that just felt like the right fit. Um, so I guess the rest is history. But uh, yeah, football helped me get in, um, and that's where I learned how how really how to study. <laughs> It'll right. do it. going around the block to get next door. Uh, I, I get it. I get it. Um, so um, when you were graduating from the Naval Academy, did you know which? Did you know you wanted to be a Marine? I mean, how did that whole process unfold for you? Yeah. I, so I stopped playing football and uh, had about eighty pounds to lose. But by that time, I knew. You know, I didn't have the eyesight to be a pilot or a SEAL. Um, you know, I'm, I'm six foot four, so I'm a bigger guy. And, um, you know, realistically, I looked at, at, at the routes and the, the directions I could go. And I was very, very intrigued. A lot of people don't understand who are maybe not as familiar with the military. Um, you know, the, the very Marine Corps feel and history and flavor and, and really hierarchical structure with the brigade of midshipmen that the, that the Naval Academy has. Um, because of the, the fact that the Department of the Navy, and Department of the Marine Corps are tied at the hip. So, you know, anywhere from 16 to 18% of the grads come out each year and go Marine Corps. Once you go in the Marine Corps, you've got over 30 specialties that you can go through once you go through the basic officer course in Quantico. So I looked at that as like a wide open, you know, choose your own adventure for lack of better terms. You know, I could go, I could go infantry, I could go intelligence, supply, logistics, artillery. And I could really decide that, you know, well, the Marine Corps decides that for you, really, but um, it's really based on, on your ranking amongst your, you know, company in the basic officer course in Quantico. And so it really was kind of a wide open, the world was my oyster, so to speak. So that's the route I chose to go. Um, and once I knew that I wanted to go that route, I lost, you know, 80 pounds relatively quickly. Eating about as much as one person does instead of two or three people, it happens. So start running. Uh, but I'm really, really glad I made that decision. It was it was an easy one to make for me. Um, did you have any sort of, uh, you know, preconceived notions about the Marine Corps, about, you know, what it was like to be a Marine or, you know, did you want to do all the the, the, the hoorah stuff that Marines do? Or is this just about a, a, a path that was... I don't want to say more difficult or just about the challenge. Um, no, I think it was both. I think the, the Marine Corps, I mean, it, it's, it's an amazing organization that the training is incredible. Um, you know, there's, there's amazing leaders. I think the Marines do do more with less, honestly. And you look at, look at our budget relative to the other branches. Um, and, uh, but yeah, no, I wanted, I wanted the challenge. I wanted, uh, I've always been very competitive. You know, that's actually something that I shared in common with Doug Zimbeck and we would compete a lot. And uh, now I wouldn't wrestle with him because uh, he would <laughs> kill me. He would kill me. But um, no, I, we competed a lot, you know, just, you know, from a physical fitness standpoint and the tests and everything. And, and uh, but no, I'm a, I'm a competitive guy. I love to play sports. I love to play challenge. You know, our high school football coach here in Lake Highlands in Dallas was a former Marine who served in Vietnam. So from, 
just even back in in starting in high school, we all had you know high and tight haircuts. Yes sir, no sir. Didn't matter where you're from, <clears throat> what your background was, uh, race. Didn't didn't matter. We're all one team. And I, and I think the Marine Corps, you know, really felt like that kind of hand in glove fit for me in that way. Um, it was very very similar in that way. So uh, I lo- I loved it. I loved the challenge. I loved the opportunities it presented. All the above. As you head off for uh, the Marine Basic course, um, you know, do you do you kind of have a pre? Do you, do you have an understanding of what you're getting into of what the, the challenges ahead of you would be? Yeah, I mean, you really they had instituted what they called a quality spread at the time. General Krulak was the um, was the commandant of, Mich- or commandant of the Marine Corps, and uh, so they they essentially you know instituted say there's 240 you know Marines in the basic officer course. And they would institute um, a quality spread. So you had top third, middle third, bottom third. And in each third, they have a certain number of billets for specialties. Uh, you know, like I said, over 30 different um, MOS choices, specialty choices that you could, you know, really, really pick. And so when I went into the basic officer course or TBS, as we call it, the basic school, Marine is full of, I mean, like all branches were full of acronyms. Um, the joke is we had a, we had a, a glossary of acronyms and terms of called the GOAT. No, no kidding. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I knew I, I thought infantry was an option. Um, I Intelligence was very, very intriguing to me. The, Why? What, what about it was intriguing? Intel? Intel, intel? Yeah. Just, I mean, uh, the opportunity to get working with, you know, real time intelligence and from coming from different sources, they they had broken up the intel field instead of just intelligence officer into four different disciplines. They had aviation intelligence, which is where I went, the direction I went. They had um, signals intelligence, ground intel, which is you work with scout sniper platoons and in, in, in that um, that direction, and then human, which is uh, basically working with you know CIA and some of the undercover forces and. Some of those guys would grow beards and not look like Marines and whatnot. And, um, so they broke it into four different disciplines. And, and I, I just thought whether I went one, one of those four or the other, it, it just it just seemed really cool to me at the time. Did you know, I mean, when you look at what you've done in your career as an intelligence officer and the jobs that you had, you, you couldn't have known at the time. And we'll get into it in a minute, obviously, as the audience hasn't heard yet, but you couldn't have known at the time all the things you were going to run into just being an intelligence officer. No, no, I'm very, I mean, obviously we're all very green as, as, as second lieutenants and we were, we just graduated. We've gone through the, the beautiful thing about the Marine Corps is that all Marine officers are rifle platoon commanders first. And so the seven months of, of TBS is really all about infantry training because that's why the Marine Corps exists is, um, you know, for the force um, readiness uh, to be an amphibious fighting force led by our infantry that is supported by all the other d- disciplines, if you will. And so, so yeah, I mean, I, I uh, it, it, it's pretty unique training. And uh, but I was green, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know what I didn't know. <laughs> My the learning curve was steep uh, from TBS, who we went to the Naval Naval Marine Corps Intelligence Training Center in uh damn neck virginia which is outside of uh you know virginia beach and uh that was five months of intensive training you know really understanding all the systems out there what's expected of you as an aviation intelligence officer so did you have any idea like i mean you must have felt like given where we were you know geopolitically in the world at this point in time that none of this stuff might come into play, right? Like, you, was combat even, or, or even any sort of mission like that, anywhere in your mind while you were going through this? Well, we knew, we knew. I mean, just at that time, obviously, we were, you know, kind of keeping Saddam and his forces in a box through Operation Southern Watch. Right. Um, but you know, following what happened in Desert Storm and how quickly that escalated, I mean, we we knew that anything could happen at any time. And we, we, we had some tensions at the time with, you know, as we still have, as we still do with North Korea, we still had tensions with Iraq, Iran. Um, those were the areas of focus for us. 
So, um, you know, we did a lot of, a lot of training to understand what, you know, the, the, the enemy's capabilities were in case there was something that needed or that was going to escalate um, in those areas, in those hotspots um, in Northern Africa as well. And so, you know, you really kind of go into it, not thinking necessarily it, it could be a quasi peacetime environment, but having to be ready that anything could happen at any time. And, and, you know, we're going to be called on relative very quickly to, to be there in support of it. All right. After in the intelligence training center, what's next for you? So after that, um, fortunately I, out of the seven aviation intelligence officers in our, in our TBS class, that's how many billets there were. Um, I ranked, um, first out of those seven. And so I got my service selection, um, Right in there, I mean, don't want to skip over it. I married my high school sweetheart, uh, Rebecca. And so we got married in, in June of um, 1996, and we moved out to Virginia Beach. And so the last couple months of, of Intel school there, she was with me. And then we loaded up a U-Haul and went to San Diego to uh, Miramar. So interesting, um, the base realignment and closure, the BRAC that happened during the Clinton, Clinton administration, uh, Top Gun, everybody associates Top Gun with Miramar, and rightfully so. I and mean, that's where Top Gun's, you know, home base was for years. Um, so before the BRAC commission had come together to, right. you know, relocate some of these and consolidate some of these bases, they they looked at, um, well, Top Gun was, was building a brand new facility in Miramar. And, you know, interestingly enough, they were there for a month and then they were moved to Fallon, Nevada. You know, where there's a lot more training area and training space for them to to do what they do because Southern California is a pretty tight area. And they closed El Toro in Southern California and, and, and Tustin, both in Orange County. And one was a fixed wing Marine Corps air station. One was rotary, rotary wing Marine Corps air station, MAG-11 and MAG-16 under third Marine, Marine aircraft, wing, aircraft wing, excuse me, third mall. And they consolidated those to to Miramar. So when I got there, it was a naval base. Still, we moved right into Top Gun's brand new facility. As um, I was assistant intelligence officer for Mag Eleven, and um, Top Gun had just left. And then by 2018, it was a full on Marine Corps air station. The transition was complete. Uh, Tustin and El Toro had closed and um, freed up. You know right hundreds of acres of prime real estate in orange county that is now being redeveloped so um you end up getting transferred to uh an fa-18 squadron as the intel officer so now you're starting to get into this whole um air portion of things right I, it always amazes me because i'm so like my brain doesn't work in that capacity to connect air and ground Right. Like I know, I know strategically in my mind, we talk about it theoretically, how it happens, but you guys who have this job of connecting those two, literally speaking from one to the other on the ground and making it all work to me is always, you know, it's just a job that I would never been suited for period. Um, what did you, were, were you apprehensive about this job? I mean, how much, you know, I, I mean, when you think of an Intel officer, like this doesn't seem like it's your specialty. So how are you sort of getting integrated into this? Well, I mean, I, I'd, I'd had a couple of years as the Intel officer at MAG-11 before I was transferring to the squadron. And the, the whole purpose of transferring to the squadron is a uh, there are two squadrons in each coast, um, Marine F-18 squadrons in each coast that are carrier base deployable squadrons. Um, and those squadrons require Intel officers because of, you know, the things that they go out and do and, you uh, uh, the operations they support and and all those good things. So I was eager to be a part of a deploying squadron. And that was kind of the goal uh, was to be the intel officer of the squadron and then assimilate into that. You know, even though we're you know 200 Marines on a ship, um, on an aircraft carrier of 4,000 um you know sailors, it it's that's that's kind of kind of interesting and unique. But uh we really do kind of fold right in as an extra squadron, uh, an extra F-18 squadron, one of the three, two Navy, one Marine. And we deployed on the Constellation as part of a Westpac deployment and support of Southern Watch. And, you know, but the, the workup cycle of that and all the, the targeting training I got to go through was, you know, targeting course 
with the Air Force in, in, um, in a base in Texas. It's a six week training course. And then I went through six weeks of, of targeting training in uh, what we call MOTS or Weapons Tactics Instructors course, WTI in uh, Yuma, Arizona. So a lot of training, 15 months of a workup cycle. We spent time out in Fallon, Nevada at, with Top Gun, you know, doing workup training, spent time out on the on the boat, um, doing four weeks at a time off the coast of California, you know, really getting ready to go, you know, support real world real world operations, um, you know, really focused on Iraq at the time. Yeah. And again, you know, for those listening, and I, we even talked about this before we were on air, like, why don't I remember this? Operation Southern Watch was one of those things that went on for essentially a decade. Um, and all of it was just sort of the post desert storm sort of, uh, we don't remember when, when, you know, a war ends, right. It's like this shit little paperwork that people sign and everyone's supposed to agree to do X, Y, and Z and everything else. And, you know, that doesn't go unwatched. It's almost like for lack of a better term, it's like parole, right? Like, you know, you have a certain, the bad guys have a certain number of things they need to do to meet parole. And, uh, you have a parole in this case, we were the parole officer to make sure that they, Iraq in this case did all these things. And that's essentially what Southern watch was right? Um, to make sure that there were no other skirmishes that, that flared up because Saddam was pissed because he lost the war. Um, right. yeah. And, and I maybe whether it was, I wasn't too young because I remember the Gulf war pretty decently vividly. I mean, I was a pre teenager, but still I remember it. Um, so you're, you're finding out you're going on this, you know, six month deployment out on an aircraft carrier. And as an Intel guy, you probably have access to more information than most of the other people in the squadron did, or even on, on the ship or anything else. So, uh, are you feeling like as you're getting ready for this, that there's going to be a flare up? Like there's a chance that something could happen? Well, we knew, we knew that there were, um, as part, like you said, of, of keeping, um, Saddam and his forces as, as a part of the UN security council resolutions that followed, um, desert storm. And we created, you know, Southern watch as a result, um, created the no fly zone, all that, like really the kind of, kind of handcuffs, right. Um, we were allowed to come in and inspect, we were allowed to do that. So we knew that he still had, you know, somewhat while we, while we, while we flew through the nose, no fly zone every day and did patrols and everything else, we still knew that he had, he had control of Iraq and he had control of the Republican guard and, and their forces and their anti-air capabilities. Um, and you know which we can get into but but so i knew going in to answer your question that yeah i mean we were going to spend a good portion of our deployment there for the sole reason of focusing on you know ensuring that they were staying you know inbounds right that they weren't and 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 they wanted i mean i think saddam at the time desperately wanted to have a an incident that would that would hit cnn you know, a lot of the American public right. went on about their their daily lives in the 90s. You know, you got the, the the tech boom, the dot com boom. Everything's great. Job market's great. People are living their life back back here. And and there was still a lot going on there. And um, and it, it was you look at the number of hours that were flown over Iraq without a, um, a mishap of some sort or an incident where, you know, engine failure where they have have to land in enemy territory as part of enforcing the no fly zone and it's a it's a it's a testament to the the maintenance teams right and all of the the coordination that went into that whether it was the air force whether it was uh navy marine corps whether it was the the british squadrons that were flying out of kuwait i mean it phenomenal but there were a lot of missions flown and saddam's goal was to ensure that he could you know, he wanted to shoot down a pilot. He wanted an incident on CNN with, you know, Christian or, or whomever, you know, yeah. right there talking about, well, we've got a down pilot. He wanted to have, you know, I mean, we knew, we knew that their goal was to have, you know, a hostage if possible. Um, so they were using different techniques to, uh, to try to, you know, bait us into getting in with, within range of some of their systems and their uh, anti-aircraft artillery, their surface-to-air missiles, et cetera. And so we had to be really, you know, on our game and and, and focused, um, knowing that that was, their, that was their goal. 
So, and I'm reading prior to you getting there. I mean, Iraq had fired surface air missiles at American aircrafts. Uh, they had crossed into the no-fly zone, sparking an aerial combat with with, with two F-14s, mm-hmm. in which you know missiles were fired back and forth. Um, and, and again, I I'm almost marveling at the fact that all this stuff that like if it happened today, boom, it'd be everywhere. Yeah, it'd be everywhere in an instant. And it just goes to show you how much had gone on that we never really talked about unless you were buried into the New York Times, CNN, the Washington Post, whatever it may be. Um, and you're walking in the middle of all this. I mean, it, 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 I'm reading about it now. Maybe it's just because I've had combat experience. It seems pretty tense. Yeah, it's, it, it was it was different uh, type of, of tense, you know, than, than some of my buddies who later on, you know, served in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. And, and yeah, it's different kind of tense. But different we, kind of, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, but it's time though jj like there nobody experienced combat we didn't see you know other than desert storm the 10 weeks that it went on and this small number of people that did it you know by the time iraq had kicked off we had cycled through you know a whole bunch of special operators in a brigade or two in afghanistan like you know i mean it was it was it was not like the, you know more and more people quickly got the the nature of combat and how devastating it was we never really had that since vietnam and so yeah. uh you talk sure. about a different kind of tense i don't think they, i don't think anybody's saying to compare it to iraq and afghanistan as far as the, the 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 combat that we saw there but in this time where everything was hunky dory and the economy was great and things were going on in the oval office whatever you want to say uh this stuff was tense yeah no, it was, uh, it was, and, and, you know, the, the, the pilots that I, I served with were, I mean, the best of the best, these guys, uh, were, you know, I say guys at the time that, you know, female pilots were, were just kind of assimilating into the, to the force. And so, um, it was mostly men in, in my squadron and, um, uh, all men in my squadron. And so, but they were, they were the best and they were incredible, you know, guys, we were, we were great friends. But, you know, it was, it was my job as, you know, ultimately being targeting officer for for the uh, air wing. You know, it was my job to ensure that any strikes we planned, um, that that, you know, all of our team, I mean, we were doing our job 100 percent of the time correctly uh, because and just like they were the maintenance crew had their responsibilities, everybody had their responsibilities. We knew they were going to go into harm's way. We knew that, you know, things would be tense for a little while while they were over Iraq. And to the extent that we had, you know, strikes to conduct or whatnot, I mean, it, it we, we, we needed to be precise. This is right on the, you know, kind of right before we got into having GPS guided munitions and whatnot. We were, uh, you know, relying on on laser, you know, guided uh, munitions and, and satellite imagery and whatnot. And so, you know, that was real-time intelligence, you know, being out in the middle of the Persian Gulf um, was a multiple, you know, you're pulling from multiple sources and it's pretty, pretty amazing at the time. You know, you look at how far technology's come. I mean, there wasn't an iPhone, there wasn't, um, you know, there may have been flip phones at the time or whatever, as the cell phones were still kind of the mini little brick that we had. But you look at the technology that we had in the military and you look at the satellite technology and you look at uh, real-time source intelligence that comes from different sources. Uh, it, it was, it was, pre- it was, it was pretty looking back on it. I mean, we were way ahead of our time from, from a, from a technology standpoint and um, really using a lot of different me, you know, sources from different means to, to ensure that we painted the best picture possible for those pilots that were preparing for their missions. So it was kind of all hands on deck every day while we were in the Gulf. Um, I, I want to ask you about the, the air, uh, the, the strikes that you had, but you, you just put something on my mind. I mean, when you are in that mindset where every day it's like, you're almost looking or waiting for something to happen. Um, do you get a sense of the pressure and stress that you're under while you're going through it? You know, I think once you get in the rhythm and the routine and the, and, and, and your daily, you know, it, the adrenaline just of, of, of the planning. And it's, you, you mean the, the Marines who worked for me, um, the sailors I worked with, the intel- other intelligence officers, they were, uh, I mean, they were, they were incredible, right? 
everybody knew what their their job was and and they did it well and um you know they would work long hours and um we were all helping each other out so i i i think there was a healthy level of stress there but it wasn't you know even though we're seven days a week and we had shifts and we had you know we were we were all hands on deck you know during our shifts and and sometimes outside of that we i didn't look at it as um I looked at it as a, as, 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 you know, we had a lot of energy, we had a lot of focus and we kind of fed off each other in that way. So you guys had conducted, and am I reading this at the largest coordinated strike during the entire decade long operation of operation Southern watch. How does this all come to pass? Like give me a little bit about the lead up and contextualize it a little bit. And, and then what, yeah, what I think we, back, I mean, and, yeah, big big picture. I mean, we had done some smaller strikes in certain areas. We had there 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 was surface surface missile that was um, deployed down, you know, in, in southern Iraq near Al Basra, um, closer to the Gulf. That you know we de- we determined that was in within range of the battle group, and so you know we had to take that out. We had to take other uh, AAA sites out. We would get real time you know intelligence and and fuse that together and figure out. OK, because it was a shell game. Right. I mean, it was constant, constantly because these are these are mobile anti-aircraft um, type you know, systems. Um, they were I mean, from, you look at it uh, relative to the coalitions like, you know, our capabilities and our our strike forces and our aircraft. I mean, obviously, they were using former Soviet you know, older generation equipment, anti-aircraft artillery pieces and, and surface air missile pieces. And so, you know, we had the upper hand in that respect, but, you know, it doesn't take, you got to be careful here because, you know, they're firing up into the air and, and then some of these, they're covering different, you know, altitudes of, of possible, you know, areas where you could have the explosions of the AAA uh, pieces you know, some of them were were fired blindly, you know, because they didn't want to turn their radar on. But um, it, the, the the cat and mouse game and 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 all of this, him trying to provoke us, I think, just built up and built up and built up. And there came a point in time where they were like, you know, we're going to coordinate. Um, like I said, the the all of our forces that were on the carry battle group, the Air Force um, operating out of Kuwait and Saudi, and then. The uh, the British um, tornadoes, the, the their forces, they were part of the co- coalition, all working in concert. You know, we 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 planned a, a huge strike that was like, you know, two different waves, um, essentially two hours long, where we were going to have aircraft uh, aircraft over Iraq over a two hour period. I remember uh, they called it Operation Gunsmoke, and essentially, you know, the 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 goal was to take out all of these pieces and put an end to this and so you know we, we worked up for three different days because it you know basically had to be blessed by the president of the u.s president clinton and had to be blessed by uh, prime minister blair um great britain at the time and so we would work up and then the next day like we'd start over because things you know these pieces would move um we would we would get the the red light and so it's like yeah wait till tomorrow and then we work up and we'd figure it out. We'd make all the strike plans and we'd, we'd, you know, get it, spend 12, 16 hours getting ready for that green light, get the red light again. And on finally that third day was a charm and we were, you know, ready to go. But the, the, even during the night, during times, you know, you're waiting on the intelligence to come in that says, okay, confirms that all these 120 plus pieces are where they are. Well, some of them weren't, some of them continue to move. And so we had to adjust very quickly, um, but it was a very successful mission. And it was a textbook operation of how to do what we did as a coalition. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, I was excited, obviously, <clears throat> to be able to be a part of it because, um, you know, it, it was one of those things that took every, every, every piece of the, the puzzle to come together just right, right? From the pilots to the intelligence officers to uh, the maintenance crews to, you know, you name it. Um, they all had equally important roles that one couldn't, the one piece of that puzzle wasn't there. 
the whole thing kind of falls apart, right? So, right. Um, you know, um, a lot of, you look at the, the the pilots and you look at what they do and, and, and how um, talented they are and how incredibly smart a lot of them are. And, you know, a lot of them have big egos and I, and I, and I love them. We're, we're good friends. We give each other our, our time, right? Who are pilots' biggest friends? Um, you know, five-year-old kids and pilots, right? So, um, we would, we would joke back and forth and we had a good camaraderie and, and even the Navy and Marine Corps, um, and the Air Force, uh, had that, you know, just collegial kind of, you know, we would, we would go back and forth and give each other a hard time. And, and yet, but it was all in, in, it was all in fun, right? We, 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 we got along very, very well. Um, and, uh, and had, had, a, had a great time working with each other. So. How do you measure uh, the success of an operation that big with so many moving pieces? Like, I mean, wh- wh- how do you grade that? I mean, I think you grade it first and foremost by, do we have any casualties? And the answer was no, zero. So that's that's the standard, like that's the first thing. And then you're looking at, okay, mission, mission success. And um, the mission was an incredible success. You look at, you know, follow up imagery and and real time strike imagery from the pilots from the cockpit camera, right? From the FLIR video in the F-14s, the F-18s, et cetera. Um, and you look at the the sites that we took out and you look at the follow up intelligence and you kind of assess, you know, we grade ourselves based on how many did we hit, how many did we take out? And, you know, I don't recall the exact uh, percentage, but it was high. And, um, you know, it, it was, it was a beautiful thing to watch kind of a, you know, poetry emotion, if you will, to watch all of it. Was that? I can imagine. Like, I mean, yeah. even, it's see back then it must've been different. Like now you could you go online on YouTube and watch like, you know, airstrikes through the ground and you just kind of watch little blips on the thing that are there. And then, and then yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we we had the ability to uh, to see a lot of things that that you know I think I think you know FLIR video and that sort of thing had been around for a while. And the military was sharing it with with the media to the extent that we could, and and you know showing our capabilities um, where we could. You know, even going back to Desert Storm, but the you know just the the effectiveness of of the weapons um, of the aircraft. It 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 was it was. It was awesome to see. It really was. Everybody was was very professional. Um, you have, you know, at the time I was, like I said, the 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 targeting officer for this carrier battle group of, you know, what seven different um, ships with, uh, you know, countless number of everybody working, like I said, in concert together. And I'm 27 year old captain, um, but the amount of responsibility that. Um, the the every branch of the armed forces places on young adults uh, they give them a lot of training they give them the tools they need and then they give them you know in a perfect world they give them the autonomy to do what they're trained to do and do it well and execute even at a younger age and uh i look back and then you know look at i've been in commercial real estate for the last 23 years now you know i'm, I'm hitting 50 and uh I'm like 27 year olds. I'm like, we were doing that at 27 year old as 27 year olds, you know, and, uh, and younger, you know, the guys, the, the enlisted Marines who worked for me and the enlisted, uh, sailors who were in the, uh, in the Intel center, you know, they were, they were sharp as attack and reliable. And, well, you know, most of them were, were just phenomenal at what they did. And, um, uh, you know, these are 18, 19, 20 year old, kids. I'm sure you served with a lot of them yourself, right? So uh, very, very impressive uh, what, you know, the the way we were able to be, you know, kind of trained and um, raise our, our game when the time came. Um, I was really proud of that. When, when you get back from that deployment after Southern Watch, um, you, you, I mean, did you get a feeling like you wanted to do this more or longer? Because typically after successful operations like that it kind of sways you a little bit from a future standpoint yeah no i you know it's a good question and and i thought long and hard about it um 
we got married, my wife and I, relatively young, so we had enough kids. And so I was really, throughout deployment, I was thinking long and hard through this. And I had a couple of mentors uh, who were majors in our squadron who, um, you know, I really looked up to that I would talk to about, you know, kind of the, although they were pilots, you know, just about, you know, going out in the private sector or staying in in the military. I, I don't think there was a wrong answer or right answer either way. I think I could have been successful had I stayed in and really had a long career. Um, and intelligence, you know, I, to, I hate to use an overused kind of cliche of the tip of the spear, but like that we were at the tip of the spear doing what we were doing then. Um, as I would have gotten a major lieutenant colonel, I, mean, I, I think you're maybe less of an opportunity to be kind of out on the point doing some of those things like I did and working more in with all the different intelligence um, areas of, you know, within DC potentially. And, you know, and we, we know all the acronyms of all the different intelligence organizations and, and working in the Pentagon and you start to have more of a staff level job. And so I thought to myself, okay, I looked at it selfishly, maybe a little bit of like, I got to do some of the things that some people will never get to do their entire life. I've been very blessed. I got to go to the Naval Academy. I got to, uh, you know, I was an intelligence officer. I did all these things and I'm 27 and I am, I could, I could get out right now, start a family, which that was very important. You know, my wife and I are both from Dallas to move back from, to Dallas, start a family um, in a, in a white hot job market. I could get a job and, have an entire career ahead of me. I could still be in the reserves. And so if I needed it, you know, I, I could, I could serve, but, um, but I could, you know, I, I hate to say that the best of both worlds where I was able to do what I did and then able to have a full career um, in the private sector, which I've had. And so, you know, from that standpoint, um, you know, I really don't think there was, like I said, you know, Mark, a right or wrong path. I, I think I've been successful the path I went, but I could have, I would have, I, you know, I did have a lot of times where I really missed the, uh, the camaraderie of the Marine Corps and the, the, um, just the, the challenge, challenging nature of the job and, and the professionalism this is very different, you know, coming out in the civilian world, as we'd say. And so, um, I missed a lot of that. My wife and I would talk about that a lot but I made the best of the decision I made, you know, so <clears throat> that's a good question. I get asked that a lot. Now there, there was one point um, where after nine 11 and you were still um, technically in the military and the IRR that you had gotten a phone call um, to, to come back. Correct. Well, actually um, no, I, I mean, I was, I was in, I was in the active res reserves. We did work up twice. Uh, once we were going to go support operations in Afghanistan, once we were going to go support, this is post 9-11, once we were going to go uh, uh, support operations in Iraq, we weren't sure where. So we stood up, we got all, you know, packed up, ready to go, um, you know, signing power attorney and and will, et cetera, and doing all that, that stuff and, and uh, you know, getting activated so that we would be, you know, reservists, but active duty, essentially. Um, in, in Iraq or Afghanistan, wherever we were going to go. <clears throat> and we stood down both of those times and they said, okay, well, this unit's this got it, this unit's got it, et cetera. But um, I think I'd mentioned to you earlier that, you know, before we came live that there was a, uh, you know, a little bit of a vacuum of really highly trained intelligence officers. And so I knew that I would be, or you know, had really thought that I would be in demand to, to go serve in some capacity um, to support those efforts in, in Afghanistan or Iraq. And so um, by the time we had had a lull for a while, um, our squadron did, or the, 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 the Marine aircraft group I work with at, uh, in, in the reserves at JRV Fort Worth, MAG-41, we had kind of a lull and a stand down. My career had really picked up in commercial real estate, which is what I do now. And uh, we had our first our first, our oldest daughter uh, was born in 2003 and later in 2003. And so I decided, you know, at that time, you know, was the 
the once a month drilling with the reserves, the two weeks of the year, all those things was, you know, we're kind of balancing that with my career and family. And, you know, I, you know, decided, okay, well, we're, we're probably not going to deploy anytime soon. And, and, uh, I am really busy with my job and I've got a, now a new baby, you know, on board. And so, um, I made the decision to, to, uh, go back kind of into the IRR, the inactive reserves. And yeah, sure enough, within three, four months after that, my unit, you know, the third time, um, they stood up, they actually went and supported operations, uh, in, in Ramadi, um, and provided in intelligence support with, uh, rotary ring, rotary wing operations. And so, you know, all the helo ops and everything going on there, taking Marines in and out of Ramadi. Um, I'm sure you've had folks on talking about the yep. conflict um, and the different battles there, but, you know, I, yeah, I, I, I had a lot of, uh, you know, I, I missed, I missed being there. You know, I was kind of had a lot of regret. I thought I was going to get a phone call. Uh, I told, I actually told my wife, I said, I'm waiting for the phone to ring because I'm going to be called back up. It's just a matter of time. Um, and it didn't happen. So um, I guess that was, you know, what, what the good Lord had in, in store for, for me at that time. But yeah, no, I did I had a lot of regret that I wasn't there to support them um, during that, that operation. Um, you know, I kept in touch with, with my Marines who were part of that squadron and, and some of the pilots and everything else. But um, you know, it was successful. They all came back and, and, uh, you know, which I'm grateful for. I mean, certainly disappointed you didn't get to go. How much of that is guilt? Yeah, no, I mean, a lot of it, a lot of it. Cause you, you feel like you're, you know, that's, that's, that's where you're supposed to be. And so, you know, I mean, one question I was like, well, why did I get out? You know, I, you know, I should have known that we'd be eventually called up. Um, but I think at the time it was one of those things where, you know, like I said, with, with, uh, an increasingly demanding career and, uh, uh, you know, I have my first child and you know, really wanted to focus on both of those things, my family and my career. And so it was uh, a difficult decision to make. Um, I did not think that the group was going to be called up that, that soon. And so, yeah, there was a level of guilt there for sure. Um, it was tough. It was tough. I felt like that's where I should be. Uh, that kind of leads me to carry the load in the work you're doing now. And even though it has been a, you know, passage of time since you had got out and, and Ramadi had happened in 2004, um, this organization, Carry the Load, which is based out of Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. uh, how does it get started? How do you get involved with them? And you know, I, I guess before, I'll, I'll ask about the guilt and what it ties to it later, but tell me how the beginning of the organization got started. Sure. Right. So there were two uh, Navy SEALs, uh, Clint Bruce and Stephen Holly, both uh, Academy graduates. Uh, Clint was two years behind me, played football with me, linebacker at Navy. Um, and uh, Stephen was a quarterback at Navy and both had gone in to, uh, you know, both are from the Dallas area. So when they got out of the SEALs, they moved back to Dallas and I think, you know, call it 2011. Um, so I may, may have been back in 2010 when when Clint. It was a Memorial Day weekend, and I think he was he was really missing, you know, a lot of his buddies. And he was looking around, and he was looking around at, at, at what you know America, and he was looking at the how Memorial Day was being honored or not honored, you know. And the fact that it had become more of a three-day weekend, um, a time to get away at the lake, kick off the summer, um, barbecue, mattress sale, you know, just another, you know, three-day weekend kind of thing. And um, not, we were not memorializing and remembering those who had paid the ultimate sacrifice. And so, you know, he had a lot of, of weight on his shoulder, so to speak. And, you know, he was walking around White Rock Lake, which is a lake here in Dallas, and um, he was just he just told his wife, you know, hey, I'm, I'm I, I got to go walk some of this off. I've got to think, you know, had his headphones in and he was walking and he saw the story as he retell you know, the story. And you can find this online pretty easily, um, a video of him kind of talking about it. 
but he saw a, a you know ramrod world war ii salty veteran who was out walking with he had his hat on and everything else and he stopped clint and he looked at him dead in the eye and he said son who are you carrying and clint said you know at the time it, it hit him and he said you know he put into words what i was feeling um i i was carrying the memory of my of my friends i was carrying the memory of um and 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 i was carrying my buddies and, and, and i didn't feel like america was doing the same and so he and steven got together and kind of worked on kind of a white paper so to speak and they were like we don't know exactly what this looks like but we're gonna create a an event on memorial day where people come out and they walk and uh they came up with the with the name carry the load for for that reason right um because it's up to us whether we're former military whether we are um we never served you know you talk to anybody and they have had a someone in the military either family or friend or a teacher who was a veteran or somebody who it was a first responder who had um, touch them in some way throughout their life, right? So you don't have to be in the military. And matter of fact, I mean, Memorial Day is not just for veterans to honor the fallen. It's not just for us to remember first responders, you know, uh, the firefighters and the police who who paid the ultimate sacrifice in 9-11. It's for all of America to remember that, you know? And so it's, it, it's a day we honor veterans in some way and first responders and carry the load does that. But more importantly, we honor the fallen. And uh, we lost touch with that. America lost touch with that. So the organization started in 2011 with a walk around Rock Rock Lake of about 300, 350 people. We raised, um, you know, less than $100,000 probably that, you know, different organizations stepping up and donating. And, you know, Clint and Stephen looked at each other and were like, what do we do with this money? And they're like, well, we, we want, you know, we need to give it away to organizations that do good and, and get it and are helping, you know, that are helping veterans who are struggling, that are helping, um, that are helping um, their family members of those who, you know, they have lost a, a loved one. And, you know, maybe their kids need help getting through college. Maybe, um, you know, like I said, vet, veterans who have, are, are contemplating suicide. I mean, the needs go on and on and on. And so as we started reaching out and getting in touch with these different organizations, we realized that, you know, started in Dallas, um, that there were, you know, numerous organizations that were doing such good for so many, but they didn't have a platform, right? They didn't have a voice. They didn't have that megaphone or the ability to help, you know, you know, they didn't, they didn't know how to tie in with other like-minded organizations that maybe had a different mission that if they couldn't help this individual or their family, this, this, this organization could. And so carry the load created that network. We created that megaphone. We created that platform and we outgrew the first White Rock Lake, you know, on that, after that first year, and we had sponsors starting to come out in droves fast forward now. And we're, you know, um, 12 years in, and um, we have raised over $40 million over the years, um, including this year. We have national relays that start that we have created the entire month of Memorial May. So we are really dedicating the entire month of May to this. And it culminates on Memorial Day in Dallas, Texas, in the Mor Memorial March. And that's a 20 hour event here in Dallas with all of our nonprofit partners here. But we have five different relays that hit every single state in the in the contiguous U.S. and and culminate here in Dallas. We have rallies throughout May in these states. Um, a lot of these groups now, you know, we started with mainly groups, as you can imagine, in Texas that were part of our nonprofit partner uh, network, and uh, now it's na it's, na it's nationwide. And when I say, if you go to carrytheload.org and you look and you kind of navigate through and, and learn about the organization and look at the different nonprofit partners that we are partnering with. It's, it's, it's those that serve veteran military first responders, their families, 
um, families of the fallen. And, and it really is amazing to see all of the good that's being done. And so you ask Clint, um, you know, I, I, I missed, this is the first carry the load that I missed. And uh, I had a little health scare uh, set back on Saturday Memorial Day weekend. And so I unfortunately spent um, part of that time in the hospital. Um, you know, thank God everything is fine. It was, it was, you know, I'm okay. It was a blood pressure thing. And, and uh, I'm very fortunate and I have an opportunity to, to, to address it and make some changes, but I digress. The point is, I really felt guilty for not being there. You know, you know I, 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 I love helping to raise money for these organizations and working with these organizations and being out there. And it's cathartic. You walk through the night and, you, and we have storyboards of Doug Zimbeck and Megan McClung and uh, Eric Christensen and hundreds of others um, who have paid the ultimate sacrifice who are out there. And people will gather around and read their story and talk about them. And um, we'll have, you know, tens of thousands of people out there over that over that Memorial Day weekend, Sunday and Monday. And I was uh, Clint Bruce was was texting me and he said, you know, at some point, JJ said, he said, first of all, you let them take care of you there in the hospital because we need you for years to come. Right. He put that in perspective. He's like, don't feel guilty. He goes, you've done, you've already done more, you know, leading up to this carry the load to, to help this carry the load and raise the money you have and set things in motion that he said, I realized three or four or five years ago, I could sit back and watch the organization that had become, uh, had really taken on a life of its own with new people, you know, stepping up, great Americans stepping up to run the organization and to, and to help it grow. And, uh, and that put it in perspective for me. He was right. You know, um, that sadness and that guilt that I'd had from, and, and, and the, just the, the, the weight that I'd had of losing my brothers and sisters. Um, some of those names I had mentioned, I carry them with me every day and I carry them with me every carry the load. Um, and I tell their stories to everybody I can. I, you know, I'm, I'm going on for a reason, but it's, it's, it really is something that allowed, as we saw how many great hearted patriotic Americans stepped up to support the cause and companies stepped up to support the cause. It, it took a lot of that pain away. Right. Um, it allowed other people to share in that understanding of those individuals legacies and to participate in that. And um, you talk to anybody who's been out there who never served and they don't get it before they go there, before they become a part of carry the load and they participate. And it may just be for two or three hours over that weekend. Um, it may be part of a relay, but then they come back and they say, you know what? I get it. I get it. And I'm glad we have an organization that's doing what carry the load's doing. So, um, and I know our, our nonprofit partners are, um, beyond grateful, you know, because all the money that we raise, I mean, there's obviously some administrative costs, but the majority of the money we raise goes back to support our, you know, continuum of care program and our awareness programs. So, um, you know, it's great. It's a year round effort now. What does, um, what does sort of working with carry the load do for you personally, when it comes to, Again, that that guilt that you talked about a moment ago of not being able to uh, to be there with your Marines. Well, because it, it, I think symbolically, you feel like you're there with them. You right. feel like you feel like you're there with them. You feel like other people are, you know, want to know about their stories, want to know about you know their um, their legacy, want to know who they were, as, and hear and hear hear not just not just read, you know, what happened with a quick snippet of their background and, and where they went to school and, and what they, where they served and how they were, um, how they were killed, but like really who they were as people. Right. And, um, and, and then meet their families, many of whom have come out and walked with us and have supported us. And so it's just, like I said, I used the word cathartic before because it is very cathartic. It is, um, 
it's a it's a it's a multifaceted organization that has a lot of different positive effects from tangible effects to intangible effects tangible effects that that support these these great organizations which ultimately you know help prevent veteran suicide suicide substance abuse um support families who have lost um fathers mothers sisters brothers um you know, send their kids through school. I mean, I could go on and on and on and talk about our nonprofit partners and, and we would talk for another, you know, three episodes. So, and I could, uh, but I won't, but I encourage everybody to go check it out. Carry the load dot org. Um, I guarantee you somewhere close to you, if you're out there and, and that's, in that's what I was gonna say. there's yeah. going to be in May an opportunity for you to come and walk with our relays and or like you know you're in atlanta right so um there's a rally you know in atlanta every year and and there's a relay comes right down through there and and so we hit every state we're we're not far away in may so um if you're looking for a way to participate and to honor you, you know you can give of course and we love for people to give um of their of their time we have a lot of volunteers primarily a volunteer based organization. And we love for people to, uh, to, you know, to give monetarily, of course, but we love people just come out and be a part of it and see what it's about. And it is a great thing. I mean, we took part in it this past May as well here locally, um, that there is a, a leg of this whole walk, um, that extends to a town near you. And when I say near within an hour, Mm -hmm. you know, like you're not, you don't have to drive three or four hours to go walk three miles, um, it, it's fairly close, close enough that if you desire enough to participate in something like this, that makes it a little, a little bit better for everybody, then I, I certainly think it's worth the time. Uh, it really is a an organization of folks carry the load is that, you know, does everything with a purpose and that purpose is grander than themselves. And I think that that's paramount when it comes to events like this and, and doing things like this. There's there's not a lot of, for lack of a better term, grandstanding with you guys. It's it's very basic, very simple, very you know. Um, let's just do this together, hand in hand, arm in arm, and 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 uh, remember those that that made the ultimate sacrifice. And I think that that is as genuine and pure as it comes. Roger that. Couldn't agree more. Well said. <laughs> Again, just just the personal experience. That's all. But it, you know, and and it goes beyond. It's, I know Memorial May is a big thing, but there. There are other programs that carry the load, you know, takes part in um, Patriot Day, Veterans Day, you know, um, and, and again, with all the other the nonprofit partners that you work with, there's there's also other ways to, to take part in this whole thing. Education uh, benefits as well. You know, it's a, yeah, it's a year round need. It is absolutely a year round need. When you really start talking about these organizations, they don't just, you know, pop up in May and, and do good um, and then go away until the next Memorial May or whatnot. I mean. They're working you know, in many cases 24-7, 365 um, to do what they do. And so, you hit, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It, it, there are all kinds of ways to to give back and to serve and to honor the fallen. And, uh, and, and like I said, we expanded it not just to be military, but to be you know, first responders as well, because they they protect us here. Right. They they they're unsung heroes in a lot of ways. And, um, a lot of them have given their lives, you know, for our communities and for our, for, uh, for our people. And so we celebrate and honor their lives and, um, and their families as well. Again, carry the load.org is where you go. Um, it, it's, it's great getting to know you. I'm, I'm glad you've got such a connection to, um, so many people, and carry the load continues to, you know, grow that network and extend it. And, you know, uh, it's, it's great to get to meet you. I know that you and I have shared some other stories, you know, non-related to, to the military across. And it, it's just, you know, I, I think when I, when I look for guests for this show, I want people to be able to have an impact, uh, not only on the audience, but on, you know, the, the active part of our audience who will go out and do these things. And I think that's important. And, and part of the reason why I wanted you on was, was to help share that because that is ultimately, you know, um, along with, with sharing the individual stories is getting an after effect, right? It, it, it's, it's putting some of these stories into motion and why people want to share them is to hope people that will join in 
uh, and do it alongside of him. So thank you so much for that. We certainly appreciate it. It's great getting to know you. I know we'll stay uh, and, and we certainly appreciate the time this afternoon. JJ Leonard, thanks for being a part yeah. of that. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for all you're doing as well. Appreciate it. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.